Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Delphine. And it's a pleasure. Thank you, thanks for having me here. Um, so what uh, I'm going to talk about uh, in the coming hour is uh, um, secure and privacy conscious federated analytics. And I will also um, explain how this can be useful taking the example of uh, uh, medical data, but of course the um, number of obligations is much broader as we're going to see. So as we know, uh, software is, eat is eating the world and machine learning is eating software. Uh, the applications of machine uh, uh, learning can be found in uh, many, many uh, areas. And you see a few examples on this uh, uh, slide. Um, and we know that to be successful, machine learning needs data. The more data, more quality data, the, the better is going to be uh, uh, actually the, the models that are trained and the best or the better are going to be the, uh, the inference. And actually this data collection is uh, relatively easy in some cases, but is way more complicated in uh, others. So, and we'll see what the implications of this uh, are. Uh, here you see uh, on, the, on this picture, the way things can be, um, let's say summarized from the first identification of the problem, then the available uh, data sources need to be identified and then additional data sources and then the statistical analysis, implementation development, communication results, and so on. Now this data sharing among multiple data owners is uh, needed, right? But the problem, problem one is actually that in many cases it is difficult notably because of privacy regulations uh, and also because of comp uh, business competition. So not, not everyone is necessarily willing to uh, share their own data. We have, we have currently, and we've talked in the past with a number of organizations and companies, and they say, look, there's no way we are going to share our data because it is uh, too strategic. Uh, now, yet, uh, clearly what is needed is a collective training of machine learning models. But the second problem that we are hitting is that ML model can leak information about the training data. And, uh, Providing machine learning as a service is something, of course, that uh, is uh, very desirable because it commoditizes in some way the, the, the whole, uh, uh, um, you know, this resource. But then uh, the issue is that then the individual data actually can be um, in some way jeopardized uh, or, or the privacy of the data can be jeopardized by this uh, uh, extensive use of uh, uh, machine learning. Now, so having said seen that, what, if we try to summarize in a, in a single sentence, what needs to be achieved here in the presence of uh, data that are sensitive is a privacy preserving training and inference of distributed machine learning models on the data of multiple parties that preserve data and model confidentiality, right? It's uh, maybe a bit longish, but it's essentially captures, let's say all the constraints that uh, are to be faced. And here's one motivation for federated analytics is about the uh, side effects of uh, uh, COVID-19 vaccine. But this would, is applicable, of course, to any actually vaccine or to any, let's say, uh, uh, global medical question, right? As we know, this is uh, the uh, major issue now is to convince the population who is not yet vaccinated to get vaccinated. And so they have to be convinced that uh, the side effects are really minor or extremely rare. The problem is that uh, side, severe side effects on vaccine are very unusual and affect very, very few people. And as a consequence, uh, in order to have some, something that is statistically significant on that front, uh, one has to gather, one has to have access to a very large a set of individuals' data, right? Because you cannot focus only on the cases that didn't that exhibit severe side effects. You have to have, to have the whole uh, picture to understand to understand what's going on. Right? So, and and as a consequence, there is this willingness to share because one has to move on, one has to get out of predicament, out of the of the pandemic. But at the same time, there are those stringent regulations. Uh, the other data access agreements and so on and so forth, right? So, and the point is that more often than not, the sensitive data are often 
are often actually siloed. And this is typically the case uh, for, 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 for medicine. So the, the rationale, if you wish, applied, of course, to this specific case of the COVID-19 pandemic is that health data management needs vigorous improvement because there's insufficient and ineffective data sharing, poor data quality, time-consuming ethical approval procedure for research protocols. We're going to come back to this. Yet, with appropriate tools and processes, it can and should be fixed, right? And this tool should be based on mathematically proven protection techniques because we are talking about things that have to be put in place and that have to resist the test of time, right? Uh, and, and this will give data management the robustness and efficiency it deserves. And that does not exist nowadays, notably uh, in the case of medical data. And the security and privacy research community, so RS notably, RS folks, must and can help, right? So it's more than time to uh, roll our sleeves and, and fix the, the, the mess and deploy, develop and deploy appropriate solutions. Right? So by doing so, if we are able to do this, then we'll be able to comply by design with regulation. So for example, GDPR, reduce the need of data access agreements because these are lengthy, costly processes and control which information is revealed and avoid therefore data leakages. Now, achieving this, uh, of course, something that many people already thought about and there exist a number of approaches. One is the most intuitive one is as depicted here on the left, fully centralized, where each, uh, uh, for example, hospital provides its own raw data to a trusted third party that runs an algorithm. Right? And there are certain number of systems that operate like this, for example, all of us or EGA uh, or Genomics England, uh, EGA stands for the e e uh, European Genomics uh, Association. Uh, and, uh, but of course, this means uh, transferring the raw data to a central database, uh, having a central point of failure, and so on, right? So this is considered to be something that um, can work in some cases, uh, but clearly is not a sustainable solution. The other solution is, okay, let's do meta-analysis, right? Let each institution provide only aggregated data, so it does already some processing locally, and then there is an algorithm that is going to be operated by a trusted third party. And for example, covidclinical.net is, is a project that works based on this uh, principle. Uh, and in this case, for each study, the aggregated data is provided by each side, but still one has to trust the central server because the central server, the trusted third party, sees the partial aggregate results. And actually these actually are vulnerable. And this has been shown in a number of papers. So another solution is to go decentralized. So we'll say, okay, let's forget this. Let's try to rather, instead of sending the data to the algorithm, let's send the algorithm to the data, just ship the executable code. Right. So, um, and so one solution that uh, does this is a, a data shield uh, in, uh, in the UK. Another one is uh, Germany plus uh, the Netherlands, so the personalized health uh, train. But here, uh, as we will see, there are still vulnerabilities. So the, the right solution is to go for something that is secure decentralized, where uh, in which case there is an algorithm and there are obfuscated slash protected results. Right? So that let's say, obfuscated protected partial result. Uh, and that provides an appropriate level of uh, protection. So if we summarize these different options uh, on this uh, on, on a single scheme, then uh, it, uh, it, it, uh, is, um, it appears in, in the following way, where you see A, where the accuracy is very high, but privacy is, of course, very low. B, improves in terms of uh, privacy, so meta-analysis improves in terms of privacy. However, it suffers on the front of uh, accuracy. C is a further improvement on the side of uh, privacy, and if done properly, is also improving in terms of uh, uh, accuracy. And the best solution to the best of both worlds, then one has to go to D, which is the full trade-off between accuracy, privacy, and uh, performance. And we'll see how to achieve this. 
So this is again a, a kind of a summary of what I just mentioned the, the, for, for the federated learning, which is they send the algorithm through the data. Uh, so for example, here you have multiple institutions and there is, uh, so each institution uh, actually provides local updates and, and then there is uh, someone who is uh, actually making use of the, of, the, of the model as it is uh, uh, computed and uh, elaborated globally. Now, the, very often there is this misconception that by sending, actually sending the algorithm through the data is enough in terms of data protection, because the output allegedly leaks, leaks nothing about the original data. And, what, and the mental picture that people have in mind is that the database, the local database at each of the sites is going to have, in the case of medicine, many patients and few attributes. And in general, beyond medicines will be here, if you wish, many records and relatively few attributes of covariates that are also called. So the algorithm is sent to, the, to this data and the output is the outcome of the local computation. And intuitively people say, well, but you know, there are so many patients and so few attributes that in any case, the outcome will lead to something that is not, uh, that is actually not, uh, um, revealing anything about individual uh, patients. However, um, if one uh, consider another mental pitch, which is that there are actually few patients, right? Uh, we each of them with many attributes. Uh, in the extreme case, it's just one patient with many attributes. Then clearly, uh, when the algorithm shows up, computation is made and the output is delivered, clearly then the output is going to leak information about the very few patients, right? And naturally, this problem is going to become more and more pressing because by the technological evolution and the medical progress, there, is, there are more and more situations where the number of attributes is increasing, right? So just because we have better tools, better equipment, uh, and uh, Typical examples where this is going to be become uh, unsustainable are rare diseases, where there are only very, very few, let's say, instantiations in, at each uh, place. Stratification of the population, where, for example, uh, you would consider only a subset of the population, for example, only uh, women who happen to be uh, uh, above a given uh, age, and uh, are affected by a given, uh, I don't know, for example, by, by melanoma. Uh, and also clearly the presence of genetic data, as you know, the DNA is a, is a very long string of, of uh, uh, characters. And so this, if it is present, of course, it tremendously increases the number of uh, attributes. Right? Uh, and uh, so this, is, this means that actually one has to really look into this uh, carefully uh, in order to make sure that the deployed solutions respond to this uh, challenge. Right. So now the, um, so this is essentially a repetition of what I, or let's say further development of what I just mentioned is that federated learning leaks and there are a number of papers that have uh, pointed this uh, out. And so I can, uh, I would uh, refer you to these, uh, to these uh, papers. Now, uh, the topic itself of privacy preserved machine learning is, a, as a consequence, a very active research area. And so you find here a number of uh, papers that explain uh, all these uh, uh, the, the things. And there's even a workshop that is called PPML that where you find uh, papers devo specifically devoted to this, uh, to this kind of concern, right? So if we now try to uh, structure this uh, a little bit, we'll see that there is, um, what the, the so-called vanilla federated learning, in which case there is only uh, the willingness to, uh, to, I mean, just relying on the fact that uh, the hope that uh, actually uh, local aggregates are providing enough protection, but this, as we have seen, is, is uh, super risky. Um, another solution relies on multi-party computation or secure multi-party computation. Uh, and I will come back to this. And actually the references you can see here are referring to uh, something that is provided at the end of the slideshow. And I guess the slideshow is going to be provided, to be put online uh, uh, after the event. 
Now, uh, so here there are a number of solutions, some of which are promising, uh, yet uh, there are, as we will see, issues that may be related to performance because it becomes heavy from the point of view of computation. It can also restrict the nature of the computations that can be carried out. Uh, then there are the solutions that are based on differential privacy. So as uh, I guess all of you know what this is about, it's essentially adding noise uh, with the hope that uh, this noise will uh, uh, bring, will, will potentially uh, confuse someone who is, for example, trying to carry out a re-identification attack. However, uh, this uh, leads to utility degradation almost by definition, because it means that there is some noise that is added. Uh, it requires very often high privacy uh, budgets, and it's not uh, very often. It's actually not easy to figure out what is. Uh, it's actually very difficult, if not impossible, to figure out the, the practical level of privacy that is achieved by this kind of uh, approach. And then a solution based on homomorphic encryption. Uh, that uh, so well, techniques we are going to come back to in in a minute, uh, uh, where the idea here is to encrypt sensitive values uh, in, in the prediction step and then train the data uh, that are assumed to be publicly available and then enable only privacy preserving uh, uh, inference. So I will come back to some of those techniques and we'll see what, what can, can be done in this field. So now, before doing so, here is uh, the kind of problem definition that uh, uh, we want to I mean, recap also of what we have seen before. We want to enable the training and an evaluation of machine learning in a distributed setting uh, to provide end-to-end -end, and, and provide end-to-end -end protection of the parties training data, the resulting model, and the queries evaluation data. Oops. So let me first, let me present now, uh, sorry, what is the problem definition? Let me move now to the to one, uh, one paper that uh, does, uh, sorry, I'm, well, no, one thing I wanted to mention before doing so is the role of ethics committees. So each um, self-respecting institution, uh, including all uh, universities in at least in uh, democratic, democratic countries, have an ethics committee. Uh, and uh, so that is in uh, US parlance called an IRB, uh, Internal Review Board, that uh, uh, actually assesses whether a given uh, intended study is compliant with ethics or not. And this encompasses notably data protection. So the way this works is that the ethics committee takes as an input, so a set of people as an input, they, they take the study protocol and the consent form uh, uh, if it exists. And then based on the legislation, based on ethics consideration, based also on other considerations, they don't necessarily insist uh, about uh, typically institutional interests. They provide one bit, which is a go-no-go -no -go decision. So the, uh, the study is allowed or not, and some feedback, right? So it's a very slow, manpower hungry, and tedious process to check the, the proposed data uh, protection measures. Uh, and um, in practice, it's, uh, uh, it provides an a priori evaluation, but usually ethics committees lose a bit track of what is happening once the study has uh, started. And there is a risk of race to the bottom, as the researchers uh, that obtain permissions to see more data will actually extract more value and will obtain a competitive uh, advantage. So it's, it's a relatively complicated game as soon as a sensitive data uh, are, um, let's say, at stake, because some influential people within the organization can maybe try to influence the committee in order to obtain more, more rights. Right. So we'll see that actually appropriate techniques solve this problem, at least from the data uh, protection point of view. OK, the problem definition I think we've seen. Now let me mention one solution that we have developed. Uh, spin a scalable promise in preserving distributed learning. This appeared at uh, PETS uh, actually and was presented last month. So it's built on a certain, as, as usual in software, a certain number of, of building blocks that I'm going to detail. So it's built on, it makes use of multi party homomorphic encryption, a combination of secure multi party computation and homomorphic encryption that I'm going to describe in a, in a few uh, seconds, and on something that is called 
cooperative gradient descent, something that is, uh, I mean, for those of you who are well versed in machine learning, know, of course, what gradient descent uh, is about, and I'll, I'll explain it a, a bit uh, later. Then there is an extended map reduce abstraction. And on top of this comes a generic uh, secure federated learning with data, data confidentiality and model confidentiality. Well, and in this, it is possible to uh, make computations that are fall in the category of generalized linear models. So typically linear and logis logistic regressions, but also multinomial uh, regression. So the first building block we need for this is um, actually uh, homomorphic encryption. So homomorphic encryption uh, is um, a technique that uh, I'm sure many of you have, uh, have uh, heard about. Uh, the idea is to be able to compute on encrypted data, right? So let's take here an example. Uh, as usual, Alice on the Bob, uh, Alice on the right, left, and Bob on the right. So Alice uh, uh, encrypts a given value um, uh, x a. So the x a now is now in this uh, in this box. Bob receives a value, and Bob e evaluates a function uh, y on uh, the value he has just received, xa, but he cannot access to this value, right? And he injects his own value xb, which is here in clear text, but that Alice is not going to see. And the result goes back and uh, Alice will be able to decrypt it, but she is not going to know what the value that was uh, input by, uh, by Bob was about. Now, of course, she uh, could take advantage of the fact that she knows xa, so in a simple example, so if it is just a sum of the two numbers, that would be trivial. But assume that uh, uh, it is a, a different case so that uh, each of them is providing, for example, 1,000 uh, 1, numbers. And uh, uh, the, the outcome is just the, the, the average value of, uh, of all of them. So it's not going to know in what order these values uh, appear, whatever, right? So now, uh, and of course, homomorphic encryption has a tremendous potential on the front of cloud computing because it would be a way for a cloud, a cloud service provider to uh, make computations on the data without actually seeing the data, in which, in which case the cloud customer would not have to trust the cloud service provider for privacy anymore. Now, another building block is secure multi-party computation. So assume there are a set of players, P1 to Pn. They want to compute a function. Uh, so this function is going to be a function of uh, the, their inputs, x1, x2, up to xn. So each of the inputs can be a scalar, can be, can be a vector, can be a matrix, it doesn't matter. And the output is y1, y2, yn. So the output for each of the players. And this output can be the same for all of them. So it could be this y1 to, to y n are all the same, but one can also imagine they are actually different for just for, for generality. So the requirements in such setting is to have privacy. So no party should learn anything more than its prescribed output. And correctness, which means that each party is guaranteed that the output that it receives is correct. So here the, an example with the five parties. Uh, so, sorry, each of them has this input x1 to x5, and then they run the secure multi-party computation, and then if we had to go through the details, it would take three hours of uh, relatively complicated math, but I'm going to, uh, a few, to abstract this a little bit, and uh, hop, voila, this is how it works. So it runs across them without a trusted third party, and at the end, each of them is going to have its own uh, output. So I cannot detail this here, but it, you know this is textbook uh, stuff, and you find plenty of uh, uh, if you have an interest, uh, plenty of uh, 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 let's say uh, well thought uh, tutorials uh, online. So uh, now the trick is that in order to do things that are meaningful in federated analytics, one has to combine multi-party. One has to combine, let's say, homomorphic encryption and uh, secure multi-party computation. Because of course we need secure multi-party computation because we want to be able to leverage on the data provided by different stakeholders. So there's no question about that. Uh, why do we need homomorphic encryption on top of this? Well, the reason is that if you do this only with secure multi-party computation, the amount of data you have to push, to, you have to, tr to transmit from one party to the next 
is actually overwhelming. So you're, you're soon or something that is so, so big that actually it's not practical on real for, for real cases. It works maybe for toy examples, but it does not work for real cases. So to make it workable, then you have to combine it with homomorphic encryption with a very simple idea, which is that you have the uh, essentially the local aggregates that are computed locally, and then the ability to compute on the but 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 are encrypted, and the ability to uh, com make computations on the on the local aggregates is provided by the fact that homomorphic encryption is used. So that's essentially the trick. Well, and so the combination of the two is called multi-party homomorphic encryption or MHE that we are going to see again in uh, the coming, uh, uh, in the, 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 the remaining uh, amount of time. Uh, if you have questions, I'm happy to pause here if you wish uh, to pose some questions. Otherwise I'll uh, continue, I'm, uh, I'm a faculty member. I'm used to talk for hours. So if I'm not stopped, I'll just continue. Very well. So uh, now this is a more pictorial representation of the of the thing. So you have here the data providers or DP stands for data provider public key of each of them, right? Uh, and a combination of all these uh, public keys leads to the computation of the public collective key, right? And so this public collective key is actually the key under which the compute, most of the computations are carried out. Right. So, which means that all the DPs that collaborate to decrypt after the subtext that are encrypted with the collective key. And this replaces actually costly cryptography operations by lightweight interactive protocols. I'll spare you the details, but you'll have an idea of uh, what this is about. And the scheme for those of, of, the, of you who are in, in crypto, the scheme is actually an, an adaptation of a scheme called a CKKS that is based on lattice-based uh, uh, crypto. Uh, let me convey the intuition of how this works for this gradient descent for linear or for logistic regression. So assume that there is, uh, one wants to compute linear regression between these six dots. Again, it's a toy example, of course, just for the sake of uh, explanation. So this is, these are, let's say, uh, so you have here X, Y pairs, and there are these six observations. And we want to find, for example, the line that best uh, interpolates these six uh, points. If everything is available in clear text, it's a very trivial problem. Uh, no, 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 no difficulty. And so in general, for if one covers also logistic regression, this is carried out by a uh, gradient descent uh, technique that would consist in starting from somewhere in the space and then step by step uh, find, let's say, the, the, the minimum of the, of the function, right? Uh, and in this way, one would find, for example, here, the, uh, the, 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 the outcome. If all data are available in clear text and are centralized, but in practice, okay, in this way, so this can be applied for for the, uh, the operations I've mentioned, so the linear logistic regression, but can be also applied for for can be as we will see can be applied for more advanced uh, solutions such as uh, uh, neural networks. Right. So um, now. If, however, this has to be carried out in a distributed fashion, so assume there are three parties, right? And so instead of these six dots to be av available all at the same place, assume that one party has the first two dots, the second party has the other two dots, and the third party has at least three dots, these two dots, right? So this is depicted here, right? So the first guy will believe, okay, the, the, the best way is actually uh, to, to, to draw a line of this kind. Now, the second will say, no, with, with my two dots, uh, well, I think it's going to be more like this. And the third one will say, no, 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 look, this is the, the best interpolation is like that, right? So this means that they might, in practice, it, 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 uh, it means that by try to find solutions but only by themselves, leveraging on the small amount of data they have, they get stuck in local minima that are not 
the correct minimum of the whole uh, uh, thing. Right? So what we have to do is to uh, take advantage of the, of the accuracy that is provided by leveraging all the, all the data without sharing the data uh, 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 in a single place. And so the idea for this is uh, that each data provider performs several local iterations and calculate each layer's partial gradients. And then these gradients are aggregated over all parties. And one party then performs the model update, if you wish, with the average of the gradient. So this is depicted here. So each uh, of, the, of the contributor does its own work. And then uh, there are there is, uh, local iterations to compute gradients. And then the global model update. So it collectively learns and improve the, the, the overall result, right? And you see here uh, homomorphic encryption in action because what is happening is that the, when one works at this level, at the global level, these operations are carried out homomorphically and not in clear text. And that is a trick that actually solved the, the, the issue that I mentioned previously. So, and then this can be used notably for, for map, in a map, map reuse uh, setting, uh, but for the, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll go maybe a bit uh, fast on this because it gets, gets to a level of detail that is maybe not needed at this stage, but you can see what is shown here are several data providers. They first do the prepare uh, operation, and then they, there is a map where each DP, so each data provider sub I locally trains on its data, and then it uses a local, the global model in order to update its local model W sub I, if you wish. And so one iterates like this, right? And at the end, one is able to make prediction uh, uh, based on this uh, uh, model, right? So it's first building of the model, enough iterations, once the model is stabilized, it can be used uh, for prediction. Okay, so, okay, there's more, more details on this. Now, one of the issues, one of the challenges here is, uh, to, is to make an appropriate parameterization because uh, one has to select the appropriate parameters for the learning, right? As you know, in machine learning, there's a certain number of parameters. You have to define your know, the re learning rate, uh, you know, how, what the, 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 if you wish, for example, the, the, the size of the steps that you do when, when you do the, the gradient design and so on. That's one, one, one thing of the machine learning. But on the side of um, uh, uh, crypto, you also have to make, to make uh, uh, some a certain number of decisions, right? And because there are also parameters. And, and these parameters, unfortunately, influence a bit each other, which means that there is know-how involved in order to find the best, uh, let's say, a combination of these parameters. So now, if we look at what uh, this boils down to, is uh, the is actually what is crucial is to check the level of accuracy that is obtained by making use of this kind of approach. And here you see. Uh, the accuracy that is provided uh, uh, on, a on a different uh, data, data sets. So here you have uh, two examples in, of a logistic regression. And then uh, here's a logistic regression one versus all with a well-known MNIST uh, data set. And this is a multinomial uh, regression. And what is uh, important here is to check uh, uh, actually what happens. Either it can be done a in a centralized way. So the, of course, the most favorable situation from the machine learning point of view where all the data are made available. They are made, made available, which means that uh, we have uh, the highest possible level of accuracy that can be reached with that uh, uh, data set, right? Uh, then is independent training, which means that each uh, tries to, to operate separately. Uh, and then there is a distributed non, not secure. So now it is actually distributed, but there is no uh, crypto involved in order to bring to, to, to secure the thing. So it, it is in a way uh, the final, the vanilla federated learning. And then the last one, the green is what we call spin. So it's a, it's a solution that may is uh, the leverages on multi-party morphic encryption. And so as you can see, if you, what the crucial thing is to compare uh, green with blue. Uh, 
the, the loss in terms of accuracy is almost negligible, right? So it is possible actually to run these things without, so in spite of, let's say, the, um, some of the rounding effects brought by crypto or things of this kind, it is possible to actually uh, retain a level of accuracy that is, that is uh, pretty high. Uh, another crucial thing is uh, what is the runtime in this case. And here what we plot is uh, uh, on the x-axis the number of features, the number of, uh, let's say, uh, covariates of the, of, the, of the data matrix. And here you see the runtime and in expressed in seconds, as you can see, up to a certain number of features, the runtime remains in terms of uh, 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 for the uh, 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 learning, remains actually uh, in the order of uh, two or three minutes, let's say three minutes, right? Uh, and then beyond that, of course, it becomes higher because then the amount of data becomes uh, uh, quite, uh, quite overwhelming. But as we can see, the, the amount of time is uh, very, very modest considering uh, how much this can uh, achieve. So if we conclude, so we have seen a generic framework to perform a cooperative gradient descent. Uh, and this provides a modern data confidentiality over the entire machine learning workflow, which was the, the goal we were uh, uh, aiming at. So we, there is no loss in terms of uh, accuracy. And we have uh, essentially a kind of end-to-end, -end, uh, we have an end-to-end -end, uh, uh, protection of the data and of the model. Now, what we are going to see next is uh, we will see how this can be used for specific applications. And we'll take a genome-wide association study as an example. Uh, and then we'll see how to securely train more complex machine learning model models. So let me start with uh, GWAS, right? So what we have uh, shown that, that we have essentially found what, uh, what we like to call the holy grail for secure fidelity analytics on health data. Uh, and this goes under, under the acronym FARM. FARM stands for Federated Analytics for Precision Medicine with Multi-Party Homomorphic Encryption. Right? And this is a joint work with uh, the MIT and the Broad Institute. Uh, Broad Institute is a, a very famous uh, uh, center uh, in uh, Boston focusing on uh, uh, life science. The idea here is, uh, well, as we've seen before, is to train and run machine learning models on decentralized data sets without seeing the data. Right? So this is built on what we've just seen on, on Spindle. Uh, and um, so what, uh, what uh, the, the way uh, we, show that it works is that what we've done is to take an existing study, uh, actually two existing studies. The first is uh, the study uh, from oncology uh, that uh, appear, appeared in natural genetics uh, and that um, uh, provides, this was a paper that appeared in 2019, um, what the paper does, it operates on data that is all centralized, all in clear text, and it provides, it computes the overall survival based uh, of, of patients over time. So this is patients who have a cancer, and as you can see here, unfortunately, their decline is uh, quite significant, right? And so what, uh, so they do this with, uh, they do essentially uh, prediction, right? Uh, and what we've shown is that we can do the same computation with FAM, so based on Spindle, while having split the, what we've done, we, we take the data set that uh, the authors have used, we split it artificially on three different data providers. We do the encryption tricks that I've mentioned. And what we show is that it is possible to reproduce exactly the same result, which means that if data are actually scattered on different sides, there is no need to centralize and to have all the data in clear text. And we also show that the runtime in order to achieve this is, uh, is actually very acceptable, is actually very fast. Um, and then the second paper, okay, this is more uh, on the performance, maybe I will skip this for the, in the, for the sake of time. Uh, there was, um, yeah, there is a second example that is, uh, actually uh, not shown here, but will, uh, will uh, oh no, it's, it's actually, actually this one. Um, 
that is a, a genome-wide association study. So as uh, some of you may know, a genome-wide association study consists in figuring out which of the variants on the, on the DNA are significant vis-a-vis -a, -vis a given phenotype, a given manifestation, for example, I don't know, the, the uh, color of the eyes or the height of a given person or the uh, susceptibility to specific disease and things of this kind, right? Which is non-trivial, right? And so usually what is uh, the way it is depicted in the, is as shown here in uh, figure A, where you see here the chromosome that are, as you know, uh, 23 in the case of a human being, but, but uh, 22 are shown here. And for each of the, of the, of the variant uh, in the, in the uh, let's say each of the base pair in the, in, the, in, the, in the chromosome, what we see here is to what extent the p-value, right, is, of, is, 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 is high or not. So the, intuitively, if you wish, the higher the, the bar, the most, the higher it has an influence on the considered phenotype, right? So, and then typically what uh, the, the specialists do is that they define and say, okay, let's set a bar that under which we consider that actually this uh, specific place on the, in the genome is irrelevant, but if it is above, then it is relevant. So we can find the association, right? And in this case, we see there are two cases of this kind. Uh, and so, this is what appeared in the original paper. The original paper was actually a paper that appeared in 2015 in the Proceedings in the National Academy of Science. Uh, and uh, we see here that there are two values where uh, it goes above the bar. Right? There are two, case, two places, one on, in chromosome three and one in chromosome six. So now in this way, it is possible to know because then it means that we can, uh, by studying a new individual, we can check their variance at that place, and then we will know well the eye color or the susceptibility to a given disease, blah, blah, blah. Right? So it's, 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 it's very valuable information. Again, in this case, uh, the authors have done everything with all data and clear text and uh, in a single place, right? A centralized. What we've done here again is to take this data set, split it, right? We chunk it in a certain number of uh, uh, sub data sets, and then shown that we were able to reproduce the results. And this appears here on B. So B is the outcome when doing the same uh, computation, but instead of doing centralized on clear text data, we do it now on data that is uh, actually uh, uh, on, in, in silo, is actually siloed, or the data never leaves uh, the, the, each of the uh, data providers. And the partial aggregates are all cryptographically protected. Right? And so we have also shown, this takes some time, so is that we also have a more expeditious solution, taking a few uh, shortcuts, but then we see the, so the result is a bit less accurate. In the case of B, as you can see, uh, the result is extremely similar to the original one. It's impossible to even do, uh, visually uh, identify uh, the uh, difference. In the case of D, we see there is uh, some tiny difference. Uh, whereas if one tries to do just an independent approach or meta-analysis, as we can see, uh, the results are very, very disappointing and we are very far from the original uh, result. And so we have shown also, then we have computed how much time that takes. It's a more complicated because it involves way more data. So the, the amount of time needed for, for this, uh, for this, uh, for this uh, system is, uh, can be in the order of... Uh, uh, thousands of uh, minutes, so it can take a full day to train a, a system with this kind of approach, but uh, this is also considered to be acceptable in that field. Um, now, the next, uh, yeah, so this is, let's say, the examples I wanted to show, and then we have worked also with, um, oops, sorry, we have worked with uh, uh, actually ethicists and um, uh, lawyers to position these kind of techniques with respect to GDPR, right? Uh, and so we have uh, produced a paper that um, explains that if one uh, performs medical data sharing uh, with this kind of approach, 
It means that the partial aggregates that are produced can be considered to be anonymous, not just pseudonymous. And therefore, this simplifies tremendously the administrative and legal procedure between institutions in order to be able to share uh, the data. The paper is online, you might want to take a, a look. Now, the next question is, okay, this is nice, but how would, would is this applicable also in the case of neural networks? And the answer is yes. So we have shown that this is doable. We've uh, published a paper at NDSS uh, this year that, uh, that shows its extension, if you wish, of what we've just seen before with the spindle on generalized linear models, which is a kind of simple de degenerating neural network of, of this kind, to something that is uh, uh, deeper and uh, more complex. And again, here, the goal is to uh, protect the parties uh, uh, training data, the resulting model, and the queries evaluation data. So here, so we have uh, end data providers. Each of them has its own data. There is a query that is willing to obtain information leveraging on the global availability of, of data, and of course, without uh, centralizing the data. Um, and uh, we assume a passive adversary model with collusion of up to n minus one uh, uh, parties. Right? So here, actually, the principle is uh, is very very similar. So again. There is going to be pro local processing, lo local model that is elaborated, and there's a global model that is refined on, uh, that is actually refined by operations that are carried out carried out homomorphically in order to protect the global the local aggregates. Right. So this, uh, of course, the goal is to provide data confidentiality and model confidentiality, as was also the case before, and so. Uh, the idea is to start by, with an offline phase with the key generation, the model initializations, and then the query defines the query, for example, the training of a given machine learning model. Uh, and um, as mentioned, the local model is being, it gets elaborated. Each data provider performs several training iterations on its data, and so on, and there is this global model that builds up. Uh, and then, depending on the policy that is used the, after the training and based on the pre-agreement, the model is either kept secret for oblivious predictions, or it is revealed to the querier. Right. Now, there are a number of challenges, right, uh, that are uh, can be, let's say, derived from uh, the overall uh, algorithm that is followed here. Uh, one has to perform an appropriate uh, gradient descent. Uh, and one that can face your know, non-polynomial activation function, heavy morphic operations, model-specific functions. Then there is uh, the bootstrapping uh, problem. I'm going to come back to this in a minute. And then the overall parameterization issue, that some things that I mentioned before, which is the tight links before, between the learning parameters and the cryptographic parameters. And here are the solutions that we have adopted for this. So in the case of gradient descent, so for example, for the non-polynomial activation functions, for example, the sigmoid or Rochelu functions is a very uh, frequently used, as you know, in machine learning, uh, especially in neural networks. Then what we do is uh, to make use of uh, uh, least square approximation of activation functions. And then uh, for heavy morphic operations, we make use of uh, packing schemes. I'm going to... Um, uh, this detail this in a minute, uh, and so on. So we have essentially, yeah, and then I'm going to also to talk briefly about the bootstrapping and uh, the parameterization is uh, uh, essentially can boil down to a kind of constrained optimization problem uh, that uh, aims at choosing the appropriate uh, 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 parameters. Um, so, Okay, I think uh, for the sake of time, as well, there's not too much time left. I'm going to be a bit fast on the details of the of this specific scheme, but I think you get uh, the intuition. So here is the querier, uh, and uh, so yeah, the bold phase values are encrypted. So the querier generates a given uh, 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 request. Then there is a technique this, uh, called the collective key switching in order to switch from the collective key of the of the system to to the uh, actually the key of the query in such a way that the query is in the position to interpret the, the results right 
So that's essentially what is shown here in terms of uh, key uh, uh, operations. So we made uh, benchmarks of the of this uh, whole thing, uh, checking the uh, contribution uh, uh, or how much uh, actually each of the operations is going to cost. I'll, I'll spare you the, the details, uh, but I'll show you some plots. And then we have again, the evaluation for the neural networks in terms of accuracy, again, with the centralized independent training, this will not secure and Poseidon, which is uh, the, the distributed secure. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, well, the situation is a bit less favorable in the sense that uh, there may be a loss in terms of accuracy and we're still working to uh, improve this. And this is related, we believe, it, to, the, uh, to some extent to the complexity of the whole thing. But the good news is that if one accepts to let the, the model train for longer, then the bar on the, on the right, so the green bar, actually keeps uh, increasing. So it is possible to run, uh, let's say, for the, the model for maybe one, one hour and two or two and get already a first, let's say, idea of the, of the outcome. But then to refine and to, to reach, let's say, the accuracy that was, or to reach almost the accuracy that was reached with a centralized approach, then it does make sense to uh, let, if needed, to, 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 to let the, the system continue uh, uh, running in the background and improve the, the outcome. Uh, so there are more examples on this one. It worked actually uh, better, on, including the CIFAR 10 and CIFAR 100 uh, data sets that are uh, known to those who are in uh, machine learning. Uh, performance, uh, so here, here actually it's uh, in this case uh, relatively fast on this specific uh, uh, example. Okay, I'll spare you the details. Uh, so if you conclude on this, so we have seen that the accuracy is, is close to non-secure distributed solutions. And there's a scale of it is actually linear with the number of parties and logarithmic with the number of features of, or the number of neurons in each of the layers of the model. Now, there is one more thing, which is uh, the quantum threat. Uh, the As you know, quantum computers, actually billions of dollars are invested every uh, every year on uh, for the development of quantum computers. And once they start operating properly, really, uh, they are going to break uh, all the currently used uh, public cryptographic uh, algorithms. Right. Uh, and uh, so this is a, a kind of a threat that we need to anticipate, uh, which is what we uh, uh, have done. And uh, so we have developed a library it's actually open source. We can uh, you can uh, take a look at the software or use it. You're most welcome to use it if you wish. It's still under development, but it got some traction already. And so it's a, a, a library that is called Latigo. Why Latigo? Because it runs. It's based on a lattice-based crypto, which is a kind of crypto that is actually considered to be uh, quantum resistant before because of the algorithm on which it relies. And why Go? Well, because it's developed in the Go language, and the Go language is particularly well suited for this kind of uh, uh, case. So it's something that we are going to present at Eurocrypt uh, in, uh, in uh, later this uh, this fall. Uh, uh, then, um, voila. So I've mentioned bootstrapping. So one thing that you you may want to know about the kind of crypto that we have talked about is that um, for, for fully homomorphic encryption, uh, uh, so which means that the, it has the ability to accommodate two operations such, such as uh, addition and multiplication. So usually the number of additions you can carry out is unbounded, but for the number of multiplications, actually you can do it a certain number and then the noise, not quote unquote noise that accumulates in the system becomes so high that uh, the you have to do something. You, at some point, you are stuck in terms of the number of, of multiplication. And so you have in some way to refresh the whole uh, uh, process. And so this is something that was, this operation was called uh, 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 bootstrapping in uh, Craig Gentry uh, in his PhD thesis in 2008. And it's something that uh, makes it possible to refresh, if you wish, the whole system and, 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 and be able to carry out an additional batch of multiplications. So this is something that has to be there in a, in a system in order to have an unbounded number of uh, operations. 
Uh, and then packing is also important because performance, as we have seen, can be an issue. And so it's very important to be able to uh, put a high number of, uh, 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 let's say, to, to parallelize, if you wish, the operations that are carried out on uh, encrypted data, because otherwise it's, it's uh, too heavy. It's, it takes too much time. So, uh, voilà. So let me just mention that uh, uh, the, we have uh, received so much traction around these uh, kind of development and techniques that uh, some uh, uh, people in my lab, younger than me, have decided to, uh, with my, of course, blessing, to launch a startup company on this called uh, TuneInsight, tuneinsight.com, uh, that is going to be incorporated uh, in five days uh, here in, uh, in Switzerland. And what it's going to provide is essentially this ability to carry out uh, operations uh, uh, on uh, data that is uh, siloed uh, while fully respecting, let's say, the privacy uh, of the people this data is about. Let me conclude. Uh, it's uh, 2 p.m., so all, with uh, almost a Swiss uh, uh, punctuality, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up at this stage. So what we've seen is that secure privacy preserving distributed machine learning is achievable. Uh, and it is going to happen. So I've shown here some of the work that we have done uh, in, uh, in the lab, but uh, I've, I'm also providing a number of references that are actually in the coming slides, as you can see. Uh, and uh, so many people are working on this. Uh, and I would say most of the problems are now solved. So uh, I presume that this is going to become a mainstream in the coming um, with, I guess, two, three years, and is going to be really a major uh, um, improvement of the situation with respect to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the ability to work on data that has to remain uh, silo. As we have seen, the solution that we believe to be the most appropriate is multi-party homomorphic encryption. So the idea is to perform computations without seeing the data and to rely on decentralized trust and of course, there is no need to transfer the data. Uh, we have seen the scalability with the number of data providers and the size of the data set. So this is uh, the good news that uh, actually there is no uh, kind of quadratic or exponential growth of, uh, of any kind. So it's uh, in the worst case uh, linear. So which means that uh, it will be possible to, to cope with uh, uh, you know, very sizable, uh, sizable problems when making use of this kind of approach. And there is no need to use differential privacy to protect partial aggregates. So uh, some people do this, but they just embed some uh, uh, imprecision or, or deliberately put, have to put noise on their partial aggregates. Uh, and this is a pity because by making use of homomorphic encryption, one can avoid this kind of deliberate uh, deterioration of the quality of the of the precision. And so I would say, I believe this is going to be a real game changer for federated analytics on sensitive data. Uh, in the case of uh, medical data, which is, of course, a canonical uh, example, but one can think, and we have actually, you are currently working also uh, with uh, people in other fields, such as you know, insurance uh, or uh, sharing data about uh, cyber attacks, or I can think also of the financial sector where there is a willingness to fight, uh, for example, uh, uh, fraud or money laundering or things of this kind. So that, actually, if you start thinking about it, it's, it's uh, uh, quite remarkable the number of um, cases where a situation where uh, the, 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 this approaches can really be beneficial to, to mankind.